Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. Great to see you this morning. Hey, I want to begin by telling you a story. When I was 21 years old, I was um, feeling God's call to go into ministry, and I really hadn't told anybody, but I was investigating different seminaries, and I had narrowed it down to four different seminaries and was praying, Lord, what seminary do you want me to go to? About that time that I was praying that prayer, a friend of mine handed me a book. He had no idea what I was praying about. He handed me a book called Fire Seeds of Spiritual Awakening. And it's a, it's a little book about revivals through the years. And I devoured the book. And one of the stories of revival in that book was about a college right across the street from one of the four seminaries that I was considering going to. And that reading that book and reading that story so impacted me. It was one of the major reasons I chose to go to Asbury Seminary. So I want to tell you the story I read in that book when I was 21 years old. It's a story from 1970. So what is that? 53 years ago. So on February the 3rd, 1970, uh, Asbury College, which is a Christian college in Wilmore, Kentucky, was having its regular student chapel service in Hughes Auditorium. And towards the end of the service, one student got up and came to the microphone and said, I have strayed away from God and I am repenting right now. And then he just knelt at the altar. Well, then another student stood up and said, I've been super religious, like I've been going to church all the time, but I've got all these secret sins. I've been cheating at school and I've been doing, and, and just, boom, just vomited the sin, and then went and knelt at the altar and repented. Then another student got up and confessed to sexual immorality, then went, repented and went to the altar. Then another student got up and confessed that she and her mom were estranged and that she hated her mom and, and that God was convicting her of that right then and there. And publicly she forgave her mom and then she went and knelt at the altar. And then another student, and then another student, and then another student. And then the bell rang, meaning that chapel is over, it's time to go to class. Nobody moved, <laughs> nobody moved. Testimony, testimony, testimony. It went on for 24 hours, 48 hours. It kept going on, worship, prayer, testimonies, worship, prayer, testimonies, for 168 hours straight, for eight days straight. This chapel service went on. Uh, it's referred to in history as the Asbury College Revival of 1970. People began to hear about it, and they, be, they came. This was before social media, 1970. Uh, they just came to check it out. And so people would walk into Hughes Auditorium, Asbury College Chapel, and the minute they walked in, they would feel God's presence, and they would come down to the altar. One news channel sent a TV reporter and a cameraman to cover it. And the TV reporter and the cameraman came in and they were standing in the back and the cameraman was filming the stuff that was going on, but listening and got so convicted as he heard a student give his testimony that he set down his TV camera <laughs> and came to the altar. Revival. Uh, Different colleges around America, begin, Christian colleges, begin to hear about it. And they said, would you just send two or three students over to our college to tell us about it? And so three students left Asbury College and went to Seattle, Washington, to Azusa Pacific University. And they got up in their chapel service, told about what was going on, and revival broke out in Azusa Pacific. You've heard of the Jesus movement. Well, this is a part of the Jesus movement that was going on in 1970, revival. I think we got a couple of pictures inside Hughes Auditorium that we can show from 1970. So there's the inside of Hughes Auditorium, just a, a, a chapel filled with people worshiping God. Look at the next picture. There's all the people kneeling at the altar, 1970. Next picture, kneeling at the altar. It's revival. So it's happened again, if you haven't heard. So February the 8th of this year, Asbury University now, they've become a university, still Wilmore, Kentucky, having their chapel services in Hughes Auditorium. And a multi-ethnic gospel choir 
was leading worship. And then the bell rang and many of the students left, but many of the students stayed. And they just continued to worship and pray. And they stayed and they stayed and they stayed. And then students from all over the campus started to come until the whole chapel was filled, 1,500 people it will hold. And they worshiped and they prayed and they gave testimony and it went on for 24 hours and then it went on for another 24 hours and then it went on for another 24 hours. It's still going on. As we're sitting in this room, it's still going on in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's on its 12th day. And uh, let me show you a few pictures from, this is, this is now, this is 2023. Look at that. It's the same Hughes Auditorium. Next picture. Yeah, they, they broke up and just pray for the people around you and people, and next picture. So Hughes Auditorium is there in the back. It's so full that people are waiting in line to get in. And they, they just can only hold a certain number of people. And so they'll wait until some people leave so that they can go in. Just revival. And it's still going on right now. And people from all over America and really all over the world have heard about this and are coming. They're driving in. They're flying in. And it's still going on as we speak. Aslan is on the move. <laughs> it's amazing. Really amazing. So I could tell you dozens of stories of revival that God has brought throughout history. Each one is powerful uh, and fascinating. But I, I want to tell you one more story that happened 2,600 years ago. 2,600 years ago, uh, there was a chapel service in the Hughes Auditorium Asbury campus in Jerusalem. And a prophet got up to speak. And his name was Zephaniah. And he called out the sins of the people and called them to repent. And his message was actually really simple. His message was, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. That was his message. And when he gave that message, the king of Judah, the president of the nation, heard the message. And when he heard it, he did what those Asbury College students did. He went down to the altar and he kneeled and he repented of his sin. And then he turned around and he, he called the entire nation of Judah, Israel, to repent. And they did. And they began to throw away their pornography and they began to throw away their idol worship. And as a nation, they returned to God and revival broke out in Israel 2,600 years ago. And when Zephaniah said the day of the Lord is coming, he meant two things. He meant the Babylonians are getting ready to come and destroy Jerusalem if you don't repent. And he meant there's also a future, fancy word, eschatological, end times day of the Lord that's coming. When Judah heard about it and they repented and Josiah, their king, repented, the Babylonians did not come and destroy Jerusalem. But then fast forward a couple decades, and there's a new king, Jehoiachin, and the people return to worshiping Baal, worshiping Asherah. They return to pornography. And Zephaniah gets up again, Hughes Auditorium, Asbury Campus in Jerusalem, and he begins to say, the day of the Lord is coming. You need to put aside and repent of these sins. The day of the Lord is coming soon. And if you don't repent, the Babylonians will come and destroy us. And Jehoi Jehoiachim did not repent. And the people did not repent. And the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. They gouged the eyes of the king out. 
and took him and the rest of the people prisoners into exile in Babylon. As I think about this true story in history, you got two groups of people hearing the exact same message. The message is the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming soon. And one group of people in Josiah's day repent and turn away from their sins and the judgment is averted and they have great joy. The next group of people under Jehoiakim do not repent, do not change their ways. And the day of the Lord comes and the Babylonians destroy them. And so I wonder, Grace Fellowship, which of those two people will we be? Uh, Because Zephaniah's message is here for us. And it refers not just to the Babylonian day of the Lord, but it also refers to an end times coming day of the Lord that you can read all about in the book of Revelation that climaxes with Armageddon. The day of the Lord is coming. How will we respond? Will we respond like Josiah or we will respond like Jehoiakim? I want us to look at the message together. So if you got a Bible, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Zephaniah, Old Testament, about 60% of the way through your Bible. If you can find the New Testament book of Matthew, go four books to the left. Zephaniah chapter two is the scripture that we're gonna look at together this morning. We're getting ready to hear the exact same message that they heard 2,600 years ago. How will we respond? Let's say a prayer, and then we're going to read this together. Pray with me, please. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come in your fullness. And uh, Lord, would you give us the grace and the power by your Holy Spirit to respond like Josiah did 2,600 years ago? And would you give us the grace and the power to respond like Asbury College students have been responding? We need your help to respond that day, that way. So speak, Lord, we're listening. Come, Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go, Zephaniah chapter two. You're about to hear the exact same message they heard. Here it is, chapter two, verse one. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation. Gather before the decree takes effect, before the day of the Lord comes, passes away like shaft. Gather before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord. Gather before there comes upon you the day of the Lord, the day of the anger of the Lord. Gather and do what? Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. By the way, that's the gospel right there. If you click on perhaps you may be hidden, it'll take you all the way over to the New Testament. The reason Jesus came and died on the cross and took all of your sins and my sins upon himself is so that he could hide us from the wrath of the day of the Lord and save us from the wrath of the day of the Lord. So what do we need to do to receive that? Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. And then as you get to verse four, all the way through the end of this chapter, just scan it with your eyes. He begins to call out all the nations around Jerusalem. And he begins to call them out and say, judgment's going to come upon you. And so look, you know, verse four, for Gaza. Well, Gaza is to the west of Jerusalem, as is Ascalon, as is Ashdod and Ekron. Just scan it with your eyes. The, the Jerathites, they're all to the west of Jerusalem. And so God's saying, I'm going to bring judgment on them. And if you had been sitting in Hughes Auditorium at the Asbury campus in Jerusalem 2,600 years ago, you would have gone, yeah, God, get them. Get those enemy nations to the west of us. They're pagan and they're, they're sinning. Get them, God. Pour out judgment on them. And then he turns in, in, in verse 8 and following. He, God pronounces the judgment that's coming on all the nations east of Jerusalem. And so I've heard the taunts of Moab, east of Jerusalem, and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boast against the territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. Do you remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Burning sulfur fell from the sky and destroyed them. And so 
Jews sitting there in Hughes Auditorium in the Asbury campus of Jerusalem would have said, yeah, God, get them. Go get Moab. Go get the Ammonites. They deserve judgment. They've sinned. And then he keeps going and you get all the way to verse 12 and he calls out the nations south of Jerusalem, the Cushites. And then in verse 13, he calls out the nations north of Jerusalem. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. Yeah, get him, God. And he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry wasteland like the desert. And the Jews are going, yeah, get him, God. Get him. They deserve judgment. Pour out the day of the Lord on them. That's all of chapter 2, denouncing all the nations around Jerusalem. Then you get to chapter 3. And the Lord says, and you, Jerusalem, the day of the Lord's coming upon you. Now, all of a sudden, sitting in Hughes Auditorium in the Asbury campus in Jerusalem, you're going, zoiks? Not us. No, all the bad guys around us, not us. He says, us. Chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to her, Jerusalem, who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests, the pastors, the pastors profane what is holy and they do violence to the law. He calls out Jerusalem and says, the day of the Lord's coming upon you as well. Do you see the pride of the Jewish people? They think all the nations around them deserve judgment, but we don't deserve judgment. And God says, no, you deserve judgment as well. If you got your sermon notes inside your bulletin, I want to show you uh, something on the, the second page of sermon notes. So I think it's actually page four of your bulletin. I sat down, I read the whole book of Zephaniah like three times and I just cataloged the sins that God called out. And so as Zephaniah is preaching to them, there's 16 sins that he calls out. And so I just want to read through these because this is what you would have heard sitting in Hughes Auditorium, the Asbury Chapel in Jerusalem campus. These are the 16 sins you would have heard called out. I just invite you, Holy Spirit, We invite you to shine a light on our lives. Are there any of these sins that you want to deal with for us? So here they are. Idolatry. That's giving your affection to anything above God. Syncretism. We talked about that last week. That's adding other worldviews to your Christian faith. Backsliding. Apostasy. Turning away from God. Stealing. Violence. Fraud. Complacency, we talked about that last week. Unbelief, sin, mistreatment of God's chosen people, pride, not listening, not accepting correction, not trusting God, not drawing near to God, rebellion against the Lord, defilement, ungodly leadership, injustice. So where is God's spirit putting his finger in your life as you hear these sins called out by Zephaniah? I want to home in on just one of these to kind of drill down deep with together, and it's pride. And so look with me again at chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. Zephaniah calls out pride in verse 10. He says, This shall be their lot in return for their pride. There's the word. Because they taunted and boasted. And then skip down to verse 15. Now he's talking to Nineveh. This is the exultant city. They've exalted themselves. That live securely. They said in their heart, I am and there is no one else. What a desolation Nineveh has become. So Grace Fellowship, I just want to camp out on pride for a little while. And uh, let's see if God's spirit wants to do anything in my life and in your life. So look in your notes. Let's talk about pride. What's the Bible have to say about this? Well, number one, the Bible has strong warnings against pride. And the fill in the blank there in your notes is the word warnings. The Bible has strong warnings against pride. Proverbs 6, 
lists seven things that God hates. Number one on the list is pride. God hates pride. James 4 said, God opposes the proud. Isaiah 2 says, the Lord of hosts has a day, day of the Lord, against all that is proud and lofty. Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride. In 1986, two ships collided with one another in the Black Sea in Eastern Europe. When they collided, hundreds of their passengers drowned and died. And so they begin to do uh, an investigation, an autopsy on what happened that caused these two ships to collide. And as they did their investigation, uh, they, they discovered that even though it was foggy, fog was not the cause. And as they did an investigation, they, they discovered that the radar systems of both ships were working perfectly fine. That wasn't the problem. As they investigated, they learned that the cause of these two ships colliding and hundreds of people dying was pride, stubbornness, pride. As they read the logs of what happened, the ships were aware of each other and they were aware that they were in each other's paths. And so this ship captain got on the radio and said, we're heading towards each other. You steer the other direction. And this ship's captain got on the radio and said, no, you steer the other direction. And this ship's captain got on the radio and said, no, you must steer the other direction. This said, no, you steer the other direction. And before they came to their senses, the two ships had collided and hundreds of people died because of pride. And I think back on some times in Lisa and I's marriage. <laughs> it's your fault. No, it's your fault. I'm not going to be the first one to apologize. I'm not going to be the first one to apologize. Is there any work that you need to do in a relationship that's heading like this? The Bible says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the Bible says, I don't care whether you were the one that was wounded or whether you were the one doing the wind, wounding. The Bible says, God says, I want you to take the initiative and apologize and reconcile and steer the other way. Don't do this. Humble yourself and do this. Number two, a second thing that I learned from scripture about pride is that pride has many faces. So faces is the next fill in the blank there in your notes. The pride has many faces. Beth Moore did a Bible study on prayer, I mean on pride. And look at what she says about her study. She says, I, I once did a Bible study on pride and I spoke on pride only to have someone remark afterward that she had far too little self-esteem to have pride. Pride is not the opposite of low self-esteem. Pride is the opposite of humility. We can have a serious pride problem that masquerades as low self-esteem. Pride is self-absorption, whether we're absorbed with how miserable we are or how wonderful we are. Ouch. Would you just underline that last sentence? Pride is self-absorption, whether we're absorbed with how miserable we are or with how wonderful we are. Perhaps God's doing some work inside of you even now. And I just invite you in a few minutes to come and kneel at this prayer altar railing and pray about pride, whether it's self-absorption over how miserable you are or how wonderful you are. Number three, the antidote for pride is humility. So the next fill in the blank there is the word humility. The antidote for pride is humility. And then I just want to add to this. Actually, the antidote is Jesus. <laughs> but to get to Jesus, we have to humble ourselves. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. The Bible says, clothe yourselves, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. 
For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Humble yourselves. How do you do that? Well, it says, by casting all your anxieties on him. According to the Bible, the way to humble yourself is to take your anxieties, your worries, all the stuff, and give it to God. And so in just a couple minutes when I'm done talking, I just invite you to come to this prayer altar railing. Bring your anxieties with you and humble yourself and cast them on Jesus. I'm thinking of uh, the prodigal son story. You know the story that Jesus told of a, of a younger son who went to his father and said, Father, give me all my inheritance money now. And the father did. And the younger son went off to a faraway country and he squandered it all in immoral living, immoral relationships and immoral sexuality. And he squandered it all. And then when he was out of money, he looked for a job and the only job he could find was feeding pigs on a farm. And if you're Jewish, that was Jesus's audience. It's the worst possible job because you don't touch pigs. And this young man found himself eating pig slop. And as he's sitting in the pig slop, the Bible says he comes to his senses and he humbles himself and starts heading back home. And as he heads back home, he runs to his father's and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm sorry, I repent. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son but would you hire me as one of your servants? Because your servants are way better off than I was in the pig slop. And in response to his repentance, the father forgives him and restores him to sonship. It's a beautiful story, but the story doesn't end there. Because when the older brother finds out about the younger brother coming back and being forgiven, the older brother is ticked off. He's mad. Like, he's like, I've been faithful on this farm and I've been going to church every Sunday and I've been giving and I serve in children's ministry. <laughs> and, 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 and I've done all these things for you, God. I've done all these things for you, Father. And you're bringing him back into sonship? And the story ends with this highly religious older brother estranged from his father. The story ends with the older brother outside the house. That's how the story ends. He's estranged from his father, despite his father wooing him. It's a story about pride. The older brother is proud of his accomplishments and that pride keeps him from the house. The younger brother is repentant of all his waywardness and that humbling himself to repent restores him to the house. The prodigal story reminds me of the story of Mozart. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Amadeus. If you haven't, go watch it. It's a great movie, uh, Amadeus. It's the story of Mozart. But it's also the story of one of Mozart's contemporaries, a man by the name of Salieri. And Salieri is the older brother. Salieri, when he's a teenager, he prays this prayer to God. God, I give you my whole life. I give you all my talent to make great music for your glory. God, I will remain single my whole life and I will help the poor and I will write music for your glory if you will make me great. And Salieri is going along and he becomes a very great composer. And then Mozart shows up. 
And Mozart has this crazy giftedness from God, crazy giftedness. And he composes music like nobody's ever heard before. And Mozart is wayward. He is in a far country with loose living and immorals. And as Salieri watches the immoral lifestyle of Mozart, and yet his music is grand, Salieri gets ticked off. He gets mad at God, and he even says, from this day forward, God, you and I are enemies. Spoiler alert, by the end of the movie, Salieri's heart is murderous, and he poisons Mozart to death. This good son, this righteous older brother, actually has a murderous, prideful heart. Number four. In light of the soon coming day of the Lord, the message of Zephaniah is this. Seek humility. So the final fill in the blank there is seek humility. The message of Zephaniah is seek humility. Look again at chapter 2, verse 3. Just want to make sure you see it. It's, it's the message of Zephaniah. Chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, God says, but this is the one, this is the person that I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Oh, Grace Fellowship, let's be that Isaiah 66 person. Let's be a person, people who humble ourselves and who are contrite before the Lord and who tremble at his word. Oh, Grace Fellowship, let's be people that when we read Zephaniah saying the day of the Lord is coming, the day of the Lord is coming soon in wrath against all of our sinful ways, let's be people who tremble at that and who humble ourselves. Psalm 34, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That's what it looks like. God opposes the proud, but when he finds a broken person who voluntarily humbles themselves before the Lord, he's close to them. That's the way inside the house. Pride is the way outside of the house. In 1995, a revival broke out among the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ. 6,000 crew staff members had gathered in Fort Collins, Colorado for their annual staff training gathering. And in the midst of that gathering, they had a worship service and they worshiped and prayed. And then a woman by the name of Nancy Lee DeMoss got up and she gave a message on pride and brokenness. And when she was done giving that message, revival broke out. Now, if you ask Nancy, she'd say, it wasn't because of me and it wasn't even because of my message. She said, God's spirit did it. God's spirit took the biblical truths about pride and brokenness and did a unique work in the hearts of his people. And people flooded the altars and people are repenting of sin. And not only that, people are getting on the phone and calling up people that they're estranged from. So this is back in 1995 before hardly anybody had cell phones. So there was lines in the lobby of this convention center they were in uh, for all the pay phones. I mean, this is in 95, you had all these pay phones in the lobby. There was lines as long as the Asbury College revival lines that I showed you in that picture. Those were the kind of lines they had in that lobby. People were waiting their turn to get a pay phone to call up their dad, whom they're estranged from, and say, Dad, I'm sorry. I, 
I've hurt you. And I'm sorry. And I want to be reconciled with you. And people are lined up in the lobby waiting for a payphone to call up their mom and say, Mom, I'm sorry. I hurt you. I want to be reconciled. And people are lined up in the lobby waiting for a payphone to call up their brother whom they're estranged from, their sister whom they're estranged from, their friend whom they're estranged from. And they're humbling themselves. I'll be the first one to get on the radio and say, I'll steer this direction. And so I want to show you what Nancy Lee DeMoss shared with that room that day in 1995. And, and so if you look in the sermon notes there, you'll see this chart. It's, it's, it encompasses two pages here. And this is Nancy Lee DeMoss's Bible study on pride and, and what pride looks like and on brokenness and what a contrite, humble, broken spirit looks like. And as I walk you through this list, I just want to walk slowly through this list. I just, would you invite the Spirit of God to show you if, if you've got anything in the left-hand column that you need to do business with God on? And maybe you'd circle it, and then maybe you come to this prayer altar railing in just a minute or two, and you do business with God over these pride issues. So here we go. Left-hand column, proud, unbroken people focus on the failure of others. Broken people are overwhelmed with a sense of their own spiritual need. Left column, proud, unbroken people maintain control. It must be my way. Broken people surrender control. Left column, proud, unbroken people have to prove they are right. Broken people are willing to yield the right to be right. Proud, unbroken people claim their rights. Broken people yield their rights. Proud, unbroken people keep other people at arm's length. Broken people risk getting close to other people. They're willing to take the risk of loving intimately. Proud, unbroken people are defensive when they're criticized. Broken people receive criticism with a humble, open heart. Proud, unbroken people are concerned about what other people think. Broken people know that all that matters is what God knows. Proud, unbroken people work to maintain their image. Broken people die to their own reputation. Proud, unbroken people want to be sure nobody finds out about their sin. Broken people are willing to be exposed. Once you're broken, you don't care who knows. Proud, unbroken people have a hard time saying, I was wrong, will you please forgive me? Broken people are quick to admit their failure and seek forgiveness. Proud, unbroken people don't think they need revival. Everybody else needs revival. <laughs> broken people have a continual sense of their need for a fresh encounter with the filling of God's spirit. Proud, unbroken people, when confessing their sin, they deal in generalities. Broken people confess their sin very specifically. Proud, unbroken people want to be served by others. Broken people want to serve others. Proud, unbroken people desire for self-advancement. Broken people desire to promote others. Proud, unbroken people think of what they can do for God. Salieri. Broken people know that they have nothing to offer God. Proud and broken people are self-conscious. Broken people are not concerned with self at all. Proud and broken people are quick to blame others. Broken people accept res personal responsibility. They can see where they're wrong. Proud and broken people are remorseful over their sin. They got caught and they found out and they wish they hadn't got caught. Broken people are repentant over their sin. They forsake the sin. Proud and broken people are concerned about the consequences of their sin. Broken people are grieving over the cause of their sin. Proud and broken people, when, it come, when, when there's conflict, they wait for the other to come and ask forgiveness. I'll let them go first in steering the ship away. Broken people take the initiative to be reconciled. They see if they can get to the cross first. Broken people go to a payphone and call up their brother and have the conversation. 
That's all. That's all I got. I, I prepared 12 pages of manuscript notes for this message. And before first service, I was praying down here and I felt like God said, just dish all that. Get up there, share your heart. You could still use some of the notes, but share your heart. What's God been talking to you about? I just want to invite you to this prayer altar railing for you to come and respond like Josiah. Respond like the Asbury College students. What's he doing inside of you? What's he talking to you about? You come and talk to him about that. In your notes there, I made some suggestions. Maybe you come to this prayer altar railing and repent of your pride. And I just gave you a prayer prompt for that. Maybe you come and kneel to this prayer altar and just come before the Lord in brokenness and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a broken person. Maybe during your prayer time, you'd say, Lord, count me in for this Wednesday night when we're gonna come together at 7 p.m. this Wednesday night in this room And all we're going to do is repentance and silence and seeking the Lord and worship. Just an hour and a half of Asbury College. (laughs) Maybe you'd say to the Lord, Lord, count me in for 40 days of prayer. So starting this Wednesday, all the way through Easter, we're declaring 40 days of prayer. And if you'll scan that QR code, we'll send you a prayer prompt text every day so that we're praying the same things together every day for 40 days. Maybe you'd be one of the 170 people that will help us call every single Grace Fellowship. So on April the 6th, any time of the day you want to, we're going to call. We're going to call every single Grace Fellowship household in the whole church on one day just to pray with you on the phone. That's it, just to pray with you. And I can't do that. We need 170 of us doing it, uh, 15 people each. And um, and so maybe you'd be one of those people. Uh, There's a QR code in your sermon notes. Scan that. Help us out with that. We'll train you. We'll give you a training packet. We'll teach you everything you need to know. Maybe you need to make a phone call. What's God doing in your heart? Um, I want to show you three short little videos from the Asbury College Revival that's going on right now. I just want to give you a glimpse of it. So watch this first video. Watch this. seminary across the street from that chapel. Three years I'm there. I can't tell you how many times I snuck over to the Asbury College Chapel. And I sometimes go to their chapel service when everybody's there. And sometimes I go just by myself. It was open all the time. I can remember one time I was my first year as a seminary student. And I went in there by myself and, and I saw that sign that they just focused on at the end there, holiness unto the Lord. And instantly God brought to my mind a way that I was not being holy in my life and convicted me of sin that I repented of. This next video is of a young man. He's just finished giving his testimony. So this is uh, from the stage of the Asbury College Revival uh, in 2023. He's just finished giving his testimony. At the end of his testimony, he said, and pray for me. I think God wants me to go to Brazil and I don't know how I'm gonna get there. And when he said that, a guy hopped up off the second row ran to the platform and threw two $20 bills right at the feet of this young man. And then another person and then another. And, and, and there's this flood of, just watch this. It's really cool. Watch it.
does that? One more video. It's just, I just want you to see how pure and simple it is. Last video, watch this. join me. If you come to the altar, we'll leave you alone unless you'd like one of us to pray with you. And the symbol for that is to cup your hands while you're at the altar. Let's do business with God, Grace Fellowship. Come on.